Hey, everybody. I'm Adam Rittenberg, and this is Chris Lowe. We're both senior writers for college football at ESPN.com, and we're here on ESPN's YouTube channel talking about the college football coaching carousel, a topic that we both write about and talk about uh, quite a big part of the year. But we're here in the month of November, and uh, th this thing is already heating up and, and going to be very interesting down the stretch. There was news on Monday with Auburn. Uh, firing coach Brian Harson, a move that was anticipated for uh, quite some time, but but actually made official in somewhat surprising fashion. So Brian Harson is the sixth Power Five coach already, Chris, who has lost his job. And let's just start there. You know, what was your reaction to again? Not surprising news, but the fact that it was it happened the way it did on on Monday. I know it took me a little bit off guard as they're obviously ready to introduce their new athletic director as well. John Cohen coming in from Mississippi state. Adam, I'd heard that Auburn was prepared to wait until November and just let this season play out before they made a move. I think having hired John Cohen or being on the, the precipice of hiring him, maybe Auburn felt like at that point that they would go ahead and make the move to part ways with Brian Harson uh, and then let John come in and his first directive would be to, hire the head football coach and not have to fire one and then hire one. So maybe that was what happened to speed it up. But no, I, I never really felt like going back to the first of the season, the way Auburn was able to, or just not able to, to hold on to leads um, and, and just had so many struggles on offense that, that Brian was going to be able to make it. And let's be honest, you know, when you had the inquiry last January, university led inquiry, uh, you sort of knew then it's Auburn that the guy was going to have a hard time making it. Yeah, no, no doubt. And I think we both agree that Brian Harson is a, a pretty good coach who just didn't fit in this environment. You know, had spent almost his entire life in, in his hometown of Boise, Idaho. Uh, obviously, led Boise State, played at Boise State, uh, comes to Auburn as an outsider, hired by Alan Green, the athletic director, who was also an outsider. And, you know, who knows, maybe if it goes differently against Alabama, they were right on the cusp of beating the Tide in the Iron Bowl last year perhaps we're not sitting here today talking about a coaching change, but th th this one was just hard to see working out from the very start. Well, there were just so many things against him. You know, you're right. Alan Green's the one that went out and hired him. He had the former president's a blessing to go hire his guy. He brought in Brian Harson. Harson is not a guy who coached or recruited in the SEC. Uh, and I don't think any of the money people there at Auburn were ever on board with Brian Harson. Now, you know Adam as well as I do. that He'd come in and he won 10 games last year. We wouldn't be here. And I agree. Had they been able to sort of pull out that Alabama game last year in the season, I'm not sure we would even be here. Uh, but when you have a university-led inquiry uh, in January, right after the first signing period, leading into the next signing period, and you've got the president, the former president now, saying, that, well, we'll make the, the, the appropriate decision, um, <laughs> that's, that never bodes well for your head football coach after being there one year. Uh, I've said repeatedly, and, and you just mentioned it, I think Brian's a good football coach. I still believe he's a fo good football coach. You don't have the kind of success he did at Boise, uh, the kind of you know extended success he had, and, and you not be a good football coach. Sometimes, though, the fit's just not right. And you see that across the country, you know, for whatever reason. And when you have money people that aren't on your side from the beginning, uh, it's very, very difficult. And, you know, his record is what it is, 9-12. But there were a lot of things that were lined up against him when he came into Auburn. And outside of being, uh, you know, a, a nine and three type year last year, or, or certainly beating Alabama, uh, he was going to have a hard time making it. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, and you know, he's on the market now and could certainly be a candidate for one of these other openings that we're going to get into here on the show. Colorado, Arizona State, both. Uh, located much closer to you know his home region of, of Idaho. Uh, Colorado is a place I think that's wanted to hire Brian Harson in the past. If he wants to return to coaching, he, he could be a candidate there. You know, we saw it last year, Chris, with that historically crazy carousel that Clay Helton at USC was the first coach fired and was the first coach hired at, at Georgia Southern. He's doing a nice job this year at, at that program. And so you know, I think we're going to see Brian Harson sooner rather than later. But if you look at this carousel as a whole, I know that I went into the season looking at four coaches, four jobs where you know, it, it was hotter than hot in terms of the hot seat. You know, Brian Harson was one. Scott Frost was another at Nebraska. Jeff Collins was another at Georgia Tech. And Herm Edwards was another at Arizona State. 
So it's really not that surprising that those four are open. Carl Durrell at at uh, at Colorado as well. Um, that that you know that that one too. So um, and then and then Wisconsin was the biggest shocker with Paul Chris getting fired back on October second. That that one no, no one really saw coming, including uh, myself after I started getting texts that afternoon about it. So it, it, it is a very crowded carousel already. I just wanted to get your ranking of the jobs because I did this for ESPN.com. I'll have an updated. Uh, list uh, later this week but how how do you rank these six open jobs right now you know you got, you got Auburn you got Arizona State Georgia Tech Wisconsin Colorado and Nebraska to me it depends on are you looking at difficulty of jobs or jobs where you can win at the highest level I mean the complexities Adam as you well know coaching football at Auburn are many and it's, you know it's, it's not like this is the first time there's been dysfunction at Auburn but, you know, that said, you go over the last 12 years, they've had three chances to either win a national title, which they did in 2010. They played for one in 2013. And then 2017, they beat back-to-back weeks in SEC play, Auburn – or, excuse me, Alabama and Georgia, go to the SEC title game. If they win that game, they're playing in the playoffs. So three times they've either won it, they played for it, or been right on the cusp of playing in the playoff in the last 12 years. So – it's been proven there on the plains that you can win at the highest level. And most coaches, in fact, just about every coach I've ever dealt with, want to go somewhere where they feel like they've got the resources, the tradition, and it's been proven that you just win at a high level. Auburn's got a ton of money in the collective. So despite all the dysfunction, despite all the cooks in the kitchen, I still think Auburn is a job, especially now in the transfer portal here, where you can go in and you can sort of get guys quickly to come in and turn it around. I still think Auburn is a job where you have the best chance to win at the highest level. Will you have more headaches at Auburn? Absolutely. You better get a lot of aspirin. You better have it by the barrel if you go there to the Plains. But I do think you can win football games and championships there quicker than you can any of those other jobs that are open. Yeah, Auburn was number one for me. And I, I struggle a little bit with it because Wisconsin has been much more consistent. They've won more conference titles in recent years, but they've never made the playoff. They've never taken that step. And Auburn always has that potential, as you outlined. I mean, other than Georgia, they're the SEC program that has the most access to the Atlanta recruiting market. And you look at their best recruiting classes over the years, they're filled with Georgia players, they're filled with Florida players, and they're filled with players from within the state of Alabama. And so I think the the right coach in that situation can have success despite all that dysfunction and a booster group that I don't think you can unify, Chris. And this is what I was going to ask you regarding candidates. Because, you know, some of the, the same names are out there. You know, Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss, Hugh Freeze at, at Liberty. Uh, Matt Rule's name has come up a little bit. Deion Sanders, Coach Prime down at Jackson State. Is there a candidate out there that we're either talking about, Mark Stoops at Kentucky's come up, that, that's either out there that we're not talking about, who has the ability to go into Auburn and actually you know, bring that group of, 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 of power brokers together as much as you can to ideally have the word that we all hear from coaches, alignment. If you have alignment, you can win at a high level. Is that even possible at Auburn? Good question. I don't think that place has ever been truly aligned or truly unified since Coach Dye was there. Coach Coach Dye no longer with us. Uh, and that's that's been a recurring theme there on the plains. Even in – we've seen guys win at a high level. Gus won at a high level. Now he had some down years, Eugene. Chiswick won the championship in 2010. He was gone in 12. Uh, go back to Tommy Tuberville. They're, they're ready to run him out of town. They're interviewing candidates, Bobby Petrino, while he's still got the job. And, oh, by the way, he comes back the next year and goes unbeaten. So it's been on and on and on. And, and yet, yes, it is a very attractive job because, as we just talked about, you, you, ha- you have had coaches come in there and win at a high level. I think more than anything, the people at Auburn, and when I say people, the fans, the diehard fans, the people who stay loyal, and even the money people there who sometimes have had their hands too much into what's going on, want somebody that's going to come in there and not be afraid to go toe-to-toe with Nick Saban and Kirby Smart. You got Kirby on one side, you got Nick on the other. In recruiting, on the field, uh, aggressive in the transfer portal, uh, not going to back down publicly, uh, guys who recruited at a high level, before in the SEC in the Southern footprint, uh, guys who've coached in that league, you understand what it mean, what it takes to coach in the SEC. 
uh, some of the battles you face. My, our good friend David Cuckliff always talks about getting in that octagon when you get into the SEC. Well, that's truly what it is. You know, some people don't want any part of it. Some people do. And I think having had that experience, I've done it, having done it and recruited at a high level and won some games against some of those teams and some of those coaches, I think will probably be boxes that John Cohen and everybody there at Auburn are going to be looking to check when they hire the head, head, head football coach. And, and clearly you mentioned Freeze, you mentioned uh, Lane. I mean, those are two guys who check some of those boxes. Uh, but I don't think they're the only ones. I mean, Deion Sanders to me is very intriguing. Somebody's going to hire Deion Sanders. Oh, yeah. you, you can mark that down. He will get a shot at a, at a power five job. I don't know. Is it this cycle? Is it next cycle? Uh, he just has too much name recognition. I think in this day and age of the transfer portal and, and collectives, there are going to be a lot of guys lining up to want to play for prime time. Uh, so I think there's a lot of names out there. You mentioned Mark Stoops. Do they take a shot at him? And maybe this is – and I don't want the Oregon fans to get mad at me because they've had guys come there before oh, and man. ask one year and go. They've been through but enough, do, Chris. Come on. I know, but, but do you look at Dan Lanning? I mean, you know, he, he he's done a nice job recovering this year. After that beatdown against Georgia, he's coached in the SEC, uh, one of the younger, more up-and-coming coaches. I mean, I don't know, but I know John Cohen uh, will, will probably not leave any stone unturned as they look to, to fill that job. And finally, once and for all, maybe, possibly, satisfy the masses there on the plains. Yeah, I think no doubt whoever they hire has to have either a direct or a regional connection because that was – what we talked about that, that really led to, to Brian Harson's uh, problems there and, and, and a tenure that, that probably never had much of a chance of, of getting on track. So it's going to be an interesting uh, look. I would probably, if you gave me Kiffin and, and freeze against the field, I probably would take Kiffin and freeze, but maybe you throw Dion there as well. And Mark Stoops is a really interesting one. I do want to get to some of the other jobs, Chris. Um, Wisconsin to me is an interesting one because of all the interim coaches that are in place right now around the country, at these power five jobs, Jim Leonard has by far the best chance to get the job permanently. And I think he realizes that you know, he told our friend and colleague, uh, Matt Schick last week on Sirius radio that um, he thinks the decision needs to happen soon because of recruiting and because of the transfer portal. Um, he believes that the team is playing in much cleaner football. The style of play has improved. They have four games left, Chris. He's two and one as the interim coach. How many of those games does Jim Leonard need to win? Or maybe it's it's it won't matter, and, and Wisconsin is going to do a full search no matter what. I, I just think this is the guy they want. He just has to win enough to for, for to kind of put them over the top and say, "Hey, it's your it's your gig. Run with it." Well, you, you sort of you would think that Adam, when they the timing when they pulled the the plug on, on Paul Chris, that they wanted to give him a chance to prove that he could be the guy. You're right. I mean, if, if he's the guy, and I think he probably is right there near the top of their list, it's harder to hire him if they continue to lose some games. And you're like, wait a minute, we just fired a guy who's had us in the Big Ten championship games peri periodically, a guy who's won 70% of his games, and we're going to hire a guy that we brought in as interim who lost, you know, three more games or what, whatever the number is that season. That makes it a harder, you know, a harder call to hire him. So, yes. I think they do need to finish up strongly, and they do need to look like a football program that's united, that's going in the right direction, that's improving as the rest of the season goes. But I know we talked about it a few weeks ago. When they made this decision, the timing of the decision to go another direction from Paul Chris made me think that they maybe had their guy or at least wanted to see how the rest of the season went to make sure that he was indeed the guy. Yeah, I mean, Jim Leonard is a – you couldn't find a better Wisconsin success story. You grew up in the middle of nowhere in the state, was a walk-on. He still looks like he's about 23 years old. Uh, goes there, becomes a three-time uh, All-American, goes out and, and plays a, a decade in the NFL – and then and then comes in and is already one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. He's turned down SEC schools. He's turned down the Green Bay Packers. This is the job he wants. He's confident. And now he's just got to go deliver. They play a good Maryland team this weekend at home. They have a, had a nice win against Purdue in, in their last game before the open week. And then it's three, you know, rivalry games, two for sure. But you get Nebraska, you get Iowa, and then you get Minnesota. And that and go out and get the job, Jimmy. And if not, I think you transition to an external pool that 
closely resembles the one that Nebraska is evaluating. Then I think you look at Lance Leipold at Kansas, who's a Wisconsin guy, was at Wisconsin Whitewater, very connected to the Wisconsin program, but also the Nebraska program. Maybe you look at Chris Kleiman at Kansas State. He's done a phenomenal job. They just beat Oklahoma State 48 to nothing. Uh, Matt Campbell. Uh, There's all sorts of guys that I think cross over for both the Wisconsin job and the Nebraska job, but the Nebraska job has not had anywhere near the consistency and success that Wisconsin has. So when you look at that job, Chris, what do you think they need and who do you think ultimately will be, you know, the choice or, or the, the one B choice for Trev Alberts as he makes this really important decision? And we're talking Nebraska now, right? Adam? Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, Nebraska can look at a team like Tennessee that has been, you know, sort of wandering in the wasteland of football for, for years and years and years, seemingly, and say, well, you know what? We can get back there. You know, Tennessee's finally back. They're one of the top two teams in the country. Uh, both of those teams mirror each other as far as their fan bases and tradition. They just haven't been relevant for a while. So I think, you know, you've got to go out and you've got to get somebody that it, that, that's a builder, not afraid to come back in there and build it the way they want to build it, you know, to establish kind of culture. See, I think Lance Lappold, is, what he's done at Kansas, you know, has just been amazing. Uh, and, and you talk about a school that had not been on anybody's radar football-wise forever. And, and to do some of the things he's done and, and some of the historic wins they've had at a place that uh, I think for the most part had foreclosed on football, uh, Kansas had. You know, you mentioned Chris Kleiman. And Chris Kleiman, I think, is a – perfect example of why and I don't understand why this is the case but for some reason ADs and presidents and chancellors in the power five ranks turn their noses upward at the FCS guys and I've never understood that when you got a guy like Kleiman who won as much as he did at North Dakota State had powerhouse programs and oh by the way was used to pressure because I haven't talked to Chris you know if they didn't win it every year you know, they thought, well, something's wrong. So he understands pressure. It just wasn't at Nebraska or Florida or Florida State or, or, or Ohio State. But maybe his success at Kansas State finally opens more doors for those guys because there's a lot of darn good football coaches in the FCS ranks. If I'm Nebraska, and let's say whether Lipo wants it or not or whether you think he's the guy or not, I certainly would be knocking on Chris Klein's door with what he's done there at Kansas State. Yeah, I, I, they're both – and, again, Matt Campbell, let's not discount Matt Campbell. They're not having a great year at Iowa State. A lot of us thought he would have already moved on by now. Certainly was a name that was mentioned at least initially for USC last year, for Oklahoma. Um, he ends up returning to Iowa State. They need to get some wins, but if you look at his overall profile, and he's sitting right there a couple hours east of Lincoln in Ames, Iowa, that would be another name to look at. Uh, two other guys I wanted to get your, your take on, and, and really one who, 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 who could be – well, both of these guys could actually fit for several of the open jobs, but um, and they're both uh, former NFL head coaches, and that's Bill O'Brien, the offensive coordinator at Alabama, and Matt Rule, who might be the most intriguing college coaching candidate, period. That is if he wants to coach in college football. He, he got a phenomenal uh, buyout from the Panthers. Uh, he does not need to work anytime soon. I know you have sons, I have sons, and I'm I'm raising my sons to be fired football coaches, ideally at Auburn or in the NFL. Uh, but Matt doesn't need to come back. If he does want to come back, I think there's going to be a lot of college teams that are going to be interested in him, and, and Nebraska is one of them, given what he did at Baylor and uh, even at Temple earlier in, in his career. So what do you think about O'Brien at Alabama, who has ties to Georgia Tech? Uh, who uh, They have an opening right now. They just hired uh, an Alabama deputy AD. O'Brien was there early in his career in the 90s with uh, with George O'Leary, and then also Matt Rule, um, now back on the market, at least technically, after getting fired by the Panthers. Well, I'll start with Rule. I had someone really close to Matt tell me, even before the season started, that if it didn't go right, or, or things just sort of went sour there in Charlotte, that Auburn was a job he sort of had his eyes on, or it was a job that he felt like had the kind of potential to go in there and win big pretty quickly. Uh, so I think I would not rule him out. Certainly, we talked about Freeze and we talked about Lane Kevin and Dion. Uh, I think Rule could, could favor pretty prominently in that job as well if he wants to coach. Now, I've also had someone tell me actually today that he's quite content to take a year off, just sort of gather himself, catch his breath. He's, you know, it's not like he's going to have problems uh, finding, a place, <laughs> finding any money to, to get food every night. Um, so 
you know, coming from what was let's be honest, which is a really bad experience in NFL for him. And he's not the first. We've seen that happen with Chip Kelly. We saw it happen with Steve Spurrier. You know, Nick Saban didn't have losing seasons, but he was just sort of okay when he was in Miami. So this is not the first time that a really good football coach has gone from college to the pros and it hasn't worked, which doesn't mean he can't come back and be really successful. But how much time does he need? But I think if he's ready to come back, he's going to get a job somewhere. And, I, again, I, I would not completely rule out Auburn. Uh, Bill O'Brien, I, I think, will be somewhere next year coaching. For, I do not expect to see Bill back at Alabama, uh, period, Adam. I think he'll be somewhere else coaching. And I think certainly he wants to be a head football coach. He's going to have, he's going to have some opportunities. Uh, Georgia Tech makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that's a hard job. It's not an easy job. I don't think it's like an Auburn or even – a uh, Nebraska or a Wisconsin where you go in and you can win pretty quickly. You're going to have to be given time to build, get your guys in there, uh, what kind of offense you're going to run, recruit to those systems. Uh, and that ain't going to happen in two years. You know, you're going to have to have some, some patience and some time. I mean, you go back and see what's happened at Georgia Tech. I mean, they decided they retired the triple option. You know, they wanted to get away from the triple option. Uh, so they did, and they just haven't had a lot of success. See, I think tech's a place where you got to do something a little bit different. You got to sort of find your niche, and you're just not going to be able to line up and beat uh, a lot of those teams you're playing, playing the same way everybody else is playing. And so, whether it's Bill O'Brien or anybody else, I think that's what's key at a place like tech is trying to find something that's maybe a little bit different and have an administration that's patient enough to give you a time to build it. Yeah, Georgia Tech, like Auburn, you know, needed to make an athletic director hire before they could really get their football search going. And, and Jay Batt, who comes in from Alabama, great fundraiser. Uh, now he's the lead guy, the AD at Georgia Tech. And you mentioned O'Brien. Uh, you mentioned what they need. Um, I, I think an interesting name, that a guy that you know, both you and I think very highly of is Jamie Chadwell at Coastal Carolina. And he is different, right? He, he does things differently schematically. He does things differently from a program culture standpoint. The knock against Jamie, and maybe it's not fair, but but it's out there, is that he's never set foot on a Power 5 campus. So this would be a big jump for a guy like him. But I think there's other coaches. You know, Mike Houston's done a nice job at East Carolina. Um, uh, Kurt Signetti's done a really nice job at James Madison. Coach Prime, I mean, who, who can forget what he did as an Atl- Atlanta sports hero for, for, the, uh, for the Falcons and the Braves? Would, would Georgia Tech look at a guy like him? Uh, it's a very interesting candidate. Listen, I wouldn't count out interim head coach Brent Key. Now they they lost a game to Virginia about a week and a half ago that that probably hurt his chances significantly. But um, you know he he's a Georgia Tech guy and uh, you know he he's obviously uh, led them to much more success than they they were getting under Jeff Collins. So it, it's an interesting candidate pool for for Jay Bat. Yeah, Brent Collins has done a terrific job of holding that thing together. And uh, you know I've known Brent for a while. I'm not at the least bit surprised. You know his toughness his steadiness and the way he went in there and, and, and clearly the players have responded to him. So I would hope Brent gets a legitimate shot. Now, sometimes there's that stigma, you know, going back, not so much with Leonard because it was a Wisconsin guy, but there's that stigma uh, when an AD uh, or a chance or a president is hiring a coach, that they don't want to stick with their own guy. They, need, they want to hire their own guy, especially when it's a new AD, you know, a, a guy like that coming in there. Now he's been at Alabama. Brent was Alabama. But typically, guys who are coming in as ADs want to hire their own football coach. Uh, you mentioned the two guys from the Carolinas that I think both uh, could coach anywhere in the country, and that's Mike Houston and Jamie Chadwell. What Houston's done at East Carolina, I think, has probably been one of the more underrated stories in college football, uh, the kind of coach he is, the way he's done it. I mean, they're, they're, they're a missed field goal away uh, from being right there in the, in the mix, you know, in the AC. And, and they seem to have gotten better and better at him. Uh, they're a well-rounded football team. Uh, he's a guy that uh, you know. You talk to people who coached against him, people who played with him. Uh, just a solid football coach. Again, and I don't think he's going to be uh, intimidated or overwhelmed whatsoever, no matter where he is, no matter what kind of stage he's on. Jamie Chadwell is the perfect example of what I was talking about a minute ago. Some of these places, I mean, you just can't line up and beat people all the time unless they're at Ohio State or Georgia or Alabama or Florida or some of these schools that, that have all the resources and are recruiting at the high, high level all the time. you got to do something a little bit different, you know, and you got to be able to recruit to that system. And I think when you look at what Jamie's done at Coastal Carolina, the way he's been able to do that, go out and find players, 
that maybe are tweeners, guys that project from high school to college and get them in the right spots uh, and run that offense, which is a little bit different than really just about anybody in college football is running. See, I think a place like Georgia Tech uh, is the perfect place for that kind of offense is to do something, bring somebody in that's doing something a little bit differently. And listen, Jamie, you know, I think his track record at Coastal Carolina, whether he has ever stepped foot on a Power 5 campus uh, in, in a coaching realm, I think it speaks for itself. I mean, I go back to Chris Kleiner. I mean, he was the FCS ranks and just kicked everybody's butt. If you can coach, you can coach. And, and guys don't forget how to coach when they go from a group of five to Power 5 or FCS. You know, if you can coach football – and, and I always use Dave Clawson as a great example of this. Dave Clawson comes to Tennessee for one year. It was an awful experience. You know, he was he was sort of a beaten guy before he got there. It was Fulmer's last year. He was a scapegoat. He didn't get to bring anybody with him. You know, but everywhere he's been, everywhere he had been, he'd won football games. There was never any doubt in my mind once, once he landed, wherever he landed, that he was going to be the coach he's always been. So he's a great example of that. And I put Harson in that class, too. I know it was an awful stretch for Auburn, you know, 9 and 12. But I think when you can coach football and prove it, and even if you go somewhere maybe that's not the right fit, when you get chances to go elsewhere, sometimes that works. So I think both those guys, I'm glad you mentioned Houston and Chattanooga, because I think both those guys are going to end up coaching somewhere pretty soon. Chris, just want to wrap up with a couple of the Pac-12 jobs that are open. Again, Arizona State was expected – uh, Colorado a little bit less expected, but but not a total shock. You know, Arizona State. You know, my question is really who's in charge? Is it Athletic Director Ray Anderson? Is it that administration? You know, who's making this football coaching hire uh, at a job that has potent, you know, NCA sanctions that are that are likely coming in some form or fashion with the investigation that's going on there. And then Colorado is just flat out one of the toughest Power Five jobs out there. You know, you and I are old enough to remember their heyday. Uh, you know, way back, but certainly under Bill McCartney, late 80s, early 90s. Um, but the program has, has, has really struggled for the most part in the last uh, 15 or, or 20 years, other than the one year that Mike McIntyre got them to the Pac-12 championship game. So, you know, who I think there's also some candidate crossover here between uh, former uh, uh, head coaches like Bronco Mendenhall, maybe Tom Herman, um, um, Brian Harson. now as a former coach. I think there's some coordinators who are interesting guy like Ryan Walters, who's a Colorado alum, who's doing an incredible job right now with Illinois' defense at Colorado. And then a guy like Kenny Dillingham, who is from the Phoenix area, very much would, would, would love a chance to be a head coach. He could, He's very young, but at, at Oregon, he's done a tremendous job with Bo Nix this year as the offensive coordinator and play caller. So how do you size up those jobs and the candidates, Chris? You know, we haven't talked a lot about assistants. We, we, we mentioned Bill O'Brien, you know, a guy that, that coached out in the Pac-12 for a while uh, and, and is now out there on, on the West Coast, Alex Grinch. You know, is he a guy that, that a Colorado or an Arizona State would take a look at? You know, when he was with Mike Leach at Washington State, um, he did a really nice job of finding players that fit his system on defense and, uh, and he played very well. You know, he was at Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley and now he's at SC. Uh, so he's coached out there a couple of different times in the Pac-12. So I think he's a guy, if you're talking assistance, Adam, uh, we'll, I think we'll get a look. I, I think Brian Harrison will be coaching somewhere next year, you know, be it at Colorado, be it at Arizona State, but another school uh, that has an opening. I think he's a guy that's going to show up out there. And, and I do think that, that you mentioned Dillingham. You know, he's another guy that uh, I think is going to get a lot of looks. But Colorado is a hard job. And it, if you ask me in Power Five, and it, it, it really shouldn't be because they, they've got tradition and they have one at a high level. You know, when when they when they had it going, I understand we're talking about different years. Okay, when they had it going back 25, 30 years ago, they did a great job of recruiting out on the West Coast, recruiting LA. And I think if, if you're going to get that program back to where they are competitive and halfway relevant, I think you got to figure out a way to go and recruit. Because you know, because SC. And UCLA and even schools back in the South, they can't recruit every great football player on the West Coast. So you got to figure out a way to get in with some of those guys in uh, LA, excuse me, LA or the LA area and see if you can get them to come to Colorado. So we went through six Power Five jobs, a lot there, Chris. Just last thing, what what will be the surprise or who could be the surprise change that we just don't see coming, whether it's a, a firing, whether it's a retirement? We do have a number of coaches, by the way. Happy birthday, Coach Saban, turned 71 on, on Monday. Not not starting anything there, but he's a guy, because given his age, you have to ask the question. Same with Mac Brown 
at North Carolina, Kyle Whittingham at Utah is an older coach. Um, what, what, what potential surprises could we see in this carousel? Yeah, I mean, you understand Nick Saban's going to be coach. We'll, we'll, we'll be long retired, two of us, and so. Nick Saban will still be coaching. Uh, 83, 84, 85, something like that. But uh, I don't know, man. You mentioned Mac Brown. I think Mac's happy. I think he really likes being back at North Carolina and coaching. How much longer does he want to go? Um, you know, they're, they really rebounded nicely this year and having a big season. Uh, so, I mean, I think when you hit that age, you know, you just never know. As long as you're healthy and feeling good, and I've talked to Mac about it, I've talked to Nick about it, uh, those guys don't necessarily want to get out of coaching because, you know, Saban always says, you know, what the hell am I going to do? Um, so, I mean, it, I understand when you get to that age part, people start asking those questions. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I think Mike Norvell is a guy who's done a nice job at sort of rebounding at Florida State. You know, what happens there? Uh, um, you know, Memphis is not a power five job, but it's something happened at Memphis. Yeah. You know, with, with still, that, that, that could be a job. And, and that could be a job if if something, again, I, I think I'm not certainly predicting something's going to happen, but it's worth watching. You know, is that a job, a guy like Deion Sanders? You know, w- w- would he be interested? Would they be attracted? Would that be an attractive job for him? Because certainly there's a huge talent base around uh, that Memphis area. So, um, you know, and Mike Leach, I think Mike Mike's one of those guys that, you know, it just seems to always win enough games that uh, enough big games that no one's ever ready to move on. But he's going to have a new AD. Okay. John Cohen going to Auburn. I think a lot of it will depend on how this season finishes, where he is. Uh, I personally would not get rid of Mike because I think Mike is always one of those guys who's going to win you enough games. And, and what are the expectations in Mississippi State? You know, but if something happens there, I mean, that could be you ask about surprises. You know, that may be one as well. Um, so I, you know, I think Satterfield at Louisville has rebounded nicely. There was, there was really a has. Yep. time there this year that I thought maybe, you know, he could be in big trouble, but the way that team has played and the way they've come back over the last month, last three weeks, I think says a lot about him and a lot about that football program. Yeah. It'd be hard to match last year's carousel, but we're sitting here on November 1st talking about six open power, five jobs and others that, that might open up uh, later on. But Chris, appreciate your time and your insight. He's Chris. I'm Adam. This has been the Coaching Carousel Show here on ESPN's YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.